we are really like entertained by the way you bring the characters to life. I think I think I could have guessed that Marcus was your favorite because every time he comes on, we're like, here he comes. He's gonna do the Marcus because it's it's so entertaining. We're we're really having fun listening to him. Melissa, the uh-huh. book is written by Nellie H. Steele. Who is Nellie H. Steele? So that's my, I guess, my fiction alter ego. Mm-hmm. There's really no like secrecy behind it. It's just that um, since I am a statistician and I have other publications under my professional name, my real name, I didn't want people to Google Melissa Sovac and see like intro stats using mini tab and then like shadows of the past and be super confused as to what I was doing. Right. So I went with the the pen name for the fiction side and my real name for the actual statistics side. So now we can keep them straight. Um, although, like I said, it's not secret. So people know, and I actually get I actually get students who take my class because they've read my books and they're like, this is the worst class. I did not actually expect it to be really stats and data science And they're like, your books are far better. But like, I've had such a peak in my classes ever since I released my books that like students are reading the books and then coming in to take the class. And then they're like rudely surprised when they find out that they actually have to learn how to use like SAS or Hadoop or Minitab. And they're like, wow, this is horrible. I'm sorry that... <laughs> But they learn something new, so that's fun and exciting for them. Well, the books are terrific, and I think I told you that they are the favorite ones of mine that I'm working on at the minute, and I'm often talking to my wife about what's happened and what the latest thing is. And the first one just kept me guessing at the beginning. I didn't know where it was going or what was going on. Is it ghost? Is it time travel? But we'll get to the, we'll get to the books in a little bit. But I want to find out more about you. So does the name Nellie H. Steele come from anywhere, or did you just make that up? No, it's actually um, the last name Steele was my grandmother's maiden name, who, by the way, is actually from Millham, England, which may be close to... Where, whereabouts is it? Uh, Millham? I can't remember the the town. I think it's Liverpool is closest to it. Well, I was born in Liverpool. So where yeah, whereabouts again? It's close to Liverpool. I don't know. I've never been over there. So. How, do you, how, do you, how do you spell it? M I L L O M. I don't. I don't know it. I don't know it. M I L L. Not Melling, which is just the closest I could think of to. Nope, it's a little town, I think, okay. which is where she was born. Right. Um, yeah. So it, it was her maiden name, and then her sister was named Helene, and they called her Nell for short. So I took those two and put them together to make that name, and right. the H is Helene. So it was from those two women who kind of impacted my life. I took the name, put it together, and then made that my pen name for fiction. Great. So there's a bit of a tribute to them in there as well. Yeah, there is. And in my first book, Shadows, the one that you worked on is actually my second book. But in my first book, Secret of Dunhaven Castle, um, the character's name is Kate, 
Catherine, Kate for short, and that was my grandmother's name, Catherine. Right, okay. And you rescue animals, and I found this out about you when we were at the very beginning. There was a lot of backwards and forwards when mm. you were choosing a narrator. And uh, I can remember <laughs> I can remember getting almost frustrated going, I don't know what this lady wants now. Now she wants samples of the voices. So anyway, but we, 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 we got it straight in the end, and it's worked out great. And uh, you and I both have a file that we share and I can put a voice in there and you can hear it and decide whether it's right. And we, we, we tweaked a few before we even started recording the book. It was great. It was, you know, I, cause I didn't know I was going to get it. And then, then when I got it, I'm like, okay. Cause I thought she's a bit lukewarm on me, this lady. I don't know. And then, you know, it, it all worked out great. Um, but what I learned because you sent, what was the audio you sent me? The, the the Mainer accent, the old Maine accent. That's right. There was an accent for, for people from the state of Maine, and I, and I had to know it. And so you you did the what the accent should sound like because I had to do a uh, he was a, he was a a clerk at a at a, at a hotel desk, wasn't he? Yeah. And and in the background, there were animals. <laughs> so just tell us about that part of your life. So basically, we live in a zoo. Um, as you heard when I recorded that, I think you heard like dogs barking and cats running. I think I said there's an awkward pause at some point when a cat has run across my lap um, because we, <laughs> though they're everywhere, we have 14 animals in the house right now. Um, that's the most we've ever had. So we're at our, our highest capacity right now. But it started out actually quite by accident. Um, we had one very old cat, and once she was gone, we were like, we're not getting more pets. Um, and then we live in like a wooded area, so there's lots of feral cats around. And uh, one of the feral cats used to come up to our window and stare in the house, and we felt very sorry for her because she looked like she was a tiny kitten and she needed help. So we fed her. And um, we thought, okay, we'll, you know, get her and get her spayed and just, you know, let her live her life. And at least we won't have more cats running around. Um, but little did we know she was the mother of four. And um, after we, she started to trust us a little, she brought us the four kittens and she brought us the father kitten. So she came in a complete package. Um, we had them all uh, spayed or neutered. Um, except the father, he was tricky. We couldn't catch him. Um, but we took her and her four babies in, and that was the start of our rescue home. So we uh, we rescued them all, had them all taken care of, and we were like, you know, we're just gonna have them spayed or neutered, and and that's it. We're not gonna, you know, if they want to come in when it's really cold outside, that's fine. But they're gonna stay in our laundry room, and we're not gonna. <laughs> they're all over the house now. Like ten years later, they're like fully ingrained in the house. A year after that. A friend of ours found um, three kittens in a cardboard box that somebody had thrown away in a dumpster. So they, they were like two weeks old. So we were bottle feeding them. And we were like, look, we can't have this many cats. Forget it. We're going to bottle feed them until they can go to the Humane Society. We're not keeping them. That didn't work out either. Like once we bottle fed them, they were ours. We kept them. So we had, I think, eight at that point. And then our last rescue came. He actually followed one of our original cats home. Um, and was looking for food and we thought something was very odd with him. He was like very afraid, but still wanting to come towards us and get food and stuff like that. So we started feeding him and we thought there was something wrong with his eye. So we're like, okay, we'll get it taken care of. We'll take him to the vet. Our vet comes to our house. So he's wonderful. Um, and we, it took us three months to be able to touch this poor little cat. And finally, when we were able to touch him, we had the vet come in and he trapped him in a bathroom in our house. And it was like pandemonium in there for like 20 minutes. Um, and finally, he came out with a cat in a bag. And he was like, he just, he ran around. He kind of climbed your walls a little bit. There's some claw holes in there. I'm sorry, but I got him. And he did the exam and he had been pretty severely abused. He had been punched and kicked. He had been beaten up. And then he had been shot with BBs. So he has BBs all over him, oh, kind of ingrained oh. in his skin. And one had gone through his eye. And that was the issue with the eye. So we had to have his eye removed, his teeth removed. Um, but he is such a sweet, darling cat. I mean, he's really friendly. Um, but his issue was he came in last and he didn't have any friends. So, um, but the thing he reacted to the most instead of his other kitty cat buddies was dogs. So we got our rescue cat a dog 
and that started the dogs coming into the house. Then we had three rescue dogs come in. Um, and then you got the dogs for the cat. We got the dogs for the cat. So I, I picked out um, a little black and white dog who's actually Riley in The Secret of Dunhaven Castle. Um, he's based on my dog, Kylo. Uh, so we got him for Percy. Um, and we felt bad bringing little Kylo in because he's like a kind of a small dog. And we felt bad bringing him in with nine cats. <laughs> so we got two siblings for him and brought them all in at once. We had three dogs come in. Uh, and then um, a, f a friend of mine that um, works with me at the university said, well, now that you have all these dogs and cats and that you've done all this work with the one that was abused and you have him living in your house and he's normal and you should work with rescue dogs. And, <laughs> and so Lynn gets me started with being a rescue for um, mill mamas. So if you're not familiar with that concept, they basically have um, young dogs and they keep them in what's called a puppy mill. So they're basically, um, they have no contact with the outside world or humans for the most part. They're kept in a cage all the time and they're force bred for years and years until they produce enough puppies and they get rid of them. Um, rescuers will come in and get them. Sometimes they'll just euthanize them, but if the rescuers can get there soon enough, they'll take them out. Um, so we have um, a, a mill mama, Lily, who was a little Yorkie. She came in next, and then we were like, we're at capacity. We're not doing any more. And somebody in my family was looking for another dog, and she was sending me pictures. And over on the side was two little dogs that needed a rescue. They had been, um, they had been in kind of a bad situation, not through any fault of the owner, but um, their original owner had fallen and hit her head and she did not recover from the head injury. Um, but no one knew that um, she had a mentally disabled son who was taking care of the dogs and they did not come in um, and put him in a group home. He had to kind of just survive for two years with these dogs. So they didn't have really good care through no fault of his. Um, they were in a pretty bad situation when they came in and got them and you had to take the two dogs together they were small, but you still had to take both of them at the same time. They couldn't be separated. And the other issue was the older one was like 10 years old. So nobody wanted a 10 year old dog. Um, nobody wanted to adopt that. And then also have the five year old dog come with them. And we were like, we can take them both. So we went and got Lizzie and Maddie. They're our newest additions. I think um, they're probably one of the ones that you heard barking when I sent the accents because they were still pretty new to the house when we were going through that. Uh, which you were a very good sport about, by the way. I, was, well, I felt bad sending the 15 accents, but I was like, I really want to make sure. So we we asked for like all 15 of them. Yeah. And I was like, it's a good sport. Um, I think at one stage when it went backwards and forwards, you said you wanted you wanted to hear me do all 15 characters. And uh, and there was something, and I said, well, just put one line from each uh, uh, and, and just let me know. And you went, oh, the, we, there won't be room to possibly do them all. And I went and I went and worked out how many lines there were on a on a And I said, look, there's like 35 lines or something on a But just put one line each and see how we go. And I'm thinking, this lady's high maintenance. I'm not even sure if I want to work with her, you know, <laughs> at that stage. But, you know, it has worked out great because they are terrific books. Yeah, they are Thank terrific you. books. And we will get to the books. So what's the connection with Maine then? Are you connected? Because you're in, where are you right now? You're in Pennsylvania. Yeah, in Pittsburgh. So what, uh, what's the connection to Maine? The connection is, there's kind of a, a little bit of a backstory. I've always wanted to go to Maine. And, and I did finally get to go like two years ago. We went, we went, um, or we went three years ago, then two years ago. And then obviously last year COVID hit and we did not get to go. There's always a place I wanted to visit. I think it's one of the most beautiful places on earth. Like a piece of my heart is always in Maine. Um, and actually the, the woman that I took my name from Helene now, um, had a home up in Maine and that's, you know, looking at pictures from her home, I, you know, was one of the things that started me off wanting to visit. But the other thing was, um, Shadows of the Past is almost a tribute to Dark Shadows, which was an old 1960s soap opera, which was set on the rocky coast of Maine. And the credits used to be the waves coming in and crashing against the rocks. And when I watched it, I was, um, I was a teenager. My mom was of the generation of I ran home and watched Barnabas when he was on on Dark Shadows. Um, and when it came back on sci-fi, she was like, oh, you should watch this show. I used to watch it when I was a kid. It was like this old Gothic soap opera. 
And I was like, okay, yeah, I, I love watching different stuff. So um, I watched it and I fell in love with the setting, the way that it was set up, um, the characters, the story. Um, so when I wrote um, Shadows of the Past, it was really a tribute to Dark Shadows. And that's why it's Shadows of the Past. We, I wanted to have shadows in the title so that it was the tribute to Dark Shadows. And that's set on the rocky coast of Maine. So it was, it was such a striking setting for me that uh, I really wanted to set a book there. And so did you grow up in Pittsburgh then? You grew up, you're, mm -hmm. you're living in your hometown, but your heart, yep. a piece of your heart is in Maine. Mm -hmm. So when you were growing up, what kind of stuff as a kid were you reading? Um, I started out with Nancy Drew, um, you know, the traditional girl mystery books. Um, and I think, you know, I went to like Victoria Holt type of books. So that kind of gothic fiction was a, a big thing when I was reading books as a kid. But I always loved like the mystery stuff, like like the Nancy Drew. They were my favorite. Um, so it was those types of things. But um, I had a nice, colorful um, childhood in terms of watching TV. My parents like used to let me watch the A-Team and stuff when I was little. So I loved watching these other characters really um you know i didn't i didn't always watch like cartoony stuff i was kind of like a, a different kid that's why my parents only had one right <laughs> you're like what, what happened we don't know we only have one. <laughs> so when did you at what age did you start properly writing then uh i actually only started like a couple years ago um and it's kind of an interesting story i always wanted to write a book but I spent a lot of time, obviously in my twenties, getting my PhD in statistics and, um, it just, it never came together. I kind of went a whole different route, went, you know, all the way through, um, straight from college to grad school. Um, I got a master's in, um, computational math and statistics. Then I went on and got another master's in statistics and finally my PhD in statistics. And then I started teaching at a local university. Um, and I, I went through all of the, you know, tenure phases and, and promotion phases. And I was kind of at the end of that journey. And it was like, well, what do I do now? So um, I was trying to think of a birthday present for my mom. And, you know, she's like, she's not real, like asking for stuff type of person. She doesn't, you know, say, oh, you know what? I would really love if you got me this or something. And if she wants something, she just goes on Amazon and gets it. So I'm like, what am I going to give her? Um, and I had just finished an application for my last promotion to my highest rank. And I had some time on my hands and I'm like, what do I do with myself now? So then I thought, maybe I write this book that I've always been telling myself I'm going to write. And then I quickly, like I started writing it and I quickly realized I had little to no idea probably what I was doing to make sure I had a good book. So then I went and started taking classes in creative writing so that I could learn, um, you know, the way to put together a good plot, put together good characters and things like that. And I had the idea there, but, you know, I, I needed a lot more information. So and I was trying to keep it a secret because it was my mom's birthday present. And I didn't want her to know. And I started like months ahead of time. So I told her uh, that I got another job. I got a second job. And she was like, this job takes up so much of your time. It, it, you're, you're continually like on your laptop or trying to do something. She's like, this, are you sure this job was a wise idea? And, and technically I did have a second job, but I ended up quitting it because I did, it was not for me. Um, so, but I just kind of let her believe that, that it was the job taking up all my time. But really it was like, I was going to class and then I was doing uh, all my writing in the evenings and stuff after work. So um, I wrote the book and I gave it to her for her birthday. I gave her a draft and she had to solve a riddle. She actually had to solve a scavenger hunt and she had to find all these different clues and all the clues created a puzzle that she had to solve. And when she solved the puzzle, she found out what was in her birthday gift, which was the book, the draft of the book. Um, and I said, it's up to you if we publish it or not, you're going to be the one who makes the call on whether or not you think it's worth being published. So she got to read it first and she got to decide whether or not we'd publish it. And we decided, um, obviously that we're going to publish it. Uh, and she said, well, I think, I think it's good. I think we should go forward with it. And we created our own little company in Novo Idea Publishing and we started, and that was, um, we started October 1st, 2019. My first book was published in November, 2019. And then we've just been rolling from there. Wow. So you've done 
So that what was the first one called again? The Secret of Dunhaven Castle. Okay, that was the first one. And then you did Shadows of the Past. And mm -hmm. then you did the portrait one, which I'm just finished today, actually. Just uh, yep. finished today. And then there's a third one. So they're, so those three are all in the same series. But the, 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 the Dunhaven Castle one, that, that was just a standalone one to get you going, really. No, that one is a series, too. We oh, have, is it? Oh, so okay. Yeah, wow. In that series. Three Out in the Shadows series. We have the Maggie Edwards Adventure series that dropped last year. And then we have a new historical mystery series coming out in May. Wow. So, oh, yeah. and, and this is all since 2019. 2019. I started January, uh, January 2019, right in that first book. And like, I was like, I have to do it. I have to set aside time for it. It can't be one of those things where it's like, um, well, when I feel like writing, I'm going to write because it's never going to get done. Right. I have to, you know, I, I write a thousand words a day, regardless of what happens, because um, I want to make this work. And I, I, you know, it's it's hard work, but I enjoy it. So I set aside time every day. It's got to be a thousand words a day today, no matter what's happened, no matter if I'm tired or I'm not feeling it. I got to push through and, and write them. And that's, you know, kind of the rhythm we use to keep the books coming. Wow. And so. How does your day work? Because you've got all these animals to look after. Yeah. You've got a full-time career as a, as a college professor. I mean, and that's not just giving the lectures and all the rest of it. There's all the admin and then all the, the marking and all that to do. How do you carve that time out? What does a typical day look like for you? When do you sleep? So we, we have a tight schedule. I'll <laughs> say that. We're up at 4 a.m., uh, and we, you four. know, I, 4 a.m. Yep. Every day. Um, and I have my, my parents to help too. So they, um, my mom and I get up at four. We, f we get one dog up then Lily, because she's the quiet one. She's the one from the mill. So she, you know, she's not a problem. Um, we get up, we feed the cats and then we start through the rest of the feeding of the humans and the dogs. Um, we work through that. And then, you know, we'll, we have, uh, we start our day, but the, the lucky thing is um, I primarily teach online, which is my preferred format. So a lot of the time I'm able to, you know, move stuff around and be flexible. But um, yeah, d um, in the morning, I usually do student appointments to um, answer questions. I do my office hours. Um, and then um, we'll also try to fit in like doing our listen throughs. So like we usually do our listen throughs of audiobooks in the morning. Um, try to get through because there's a there's a lot it's not just writing the book right it's like marketing the book and revising the books and and all that kind of stuff so we try to try to like build that into our day little by little and then in the afternoon of course we have second rounds of feeding start to come in and we like work stuff around there little projects and things like that and then mostly what I do is when I write I write in the evening um, because I've kind of gotten used to that because I was writing that book on the sly. So I was trying to like do it when no one would, would, would know, or people would just think that, you know, I was doing other work at the end of my day. And so like, whenever we kind of settle down for the day and the dogs start to get quiet and nap for, uh, in the evening, we got the TV on, which they love to just zonk out to. And then I write. Right. So you just hide yourself away and, uh, and yet I suppose you have to run interference on interruptions, do you? Actually, I don't. I, I am in the living room with the TV on and write with the noise in the background. Um, I got, yeah, I got used to that because I didn't want to, I didn't want to like hide away. And then people would get suspicious about what I was doing when I was keeping the book secret. So I find I, that incredible I, because I know how complex the stories are for you to keep track of everything and the many characters while there's a TV on. I don't know. I couldn't do that. I don't know anyone who could. Yeah, I, I got used to listening to that noise in the background when I wrote Secret of Dunhaven Castle and it just stuck. Um, and I think you know, I draw, like we watch a lot of old stuff. So I draw like a lot of, you know, conversational skills between characters and stuff from watching these really old soap operas like Dynasty, right? They've got great dialogue on Dynasty. 
So, you know, it's going in the background and it's like making me think, how am I going to have these characters relate together? Because they're very complex stories. There's always something super crazy going on on one of those 1980s soap operas. So I'll have that going in the background. And, I, and that's like my key to keep pulling everything together because I, I watch how they do it. And then I mimic a little bit how they put their characters together, how they um, build dramatic scenes. Um, how the dialogue drives the story forward and things like that. Wow. Well, let's talk about the the first, the one that's on sale now that I did with you, which is Shadows of the Past. And I have to admit, when you first started giving me the information about the book, because we, we started with the characters and getting them right, mm -hmm. and you started telling me things, and I started getting more and more confused, because <laughs> especially when you said things like, well, Josie and Celine are the same person, but Josie's American and Celine's French. And Celine lives in the 1700s. And I was like, I don't even know how this is all going to work, but let's just, and it was just like one piece at a time. Okay, let's get the characters right. Okay, Melissa's happy with the characters now. Okay, let's start with the story now and let's just, let's just get into it. And it's just so intriguing. The first half of that first book, it's like, what is going on here? Why is she have? where are these memories coming from? And then, and you know, and then she goes under the hypnosis and then, and then who's this strange guy that showed up in this music box? And it's just wonderful how Thanks. you did that with all the, the TV blaring and stuff. That is the biggest shock of this call for me so far, because I would have to be <laughs> hidden away in a in a mountain cabin to get my head around that and keep it all straight. But to do it on the couch while the, the TV's on. So the, where did you start then with the book? Was it with the characters or did the characters and then and then you have to put a story? Or did you start with the story and then you need characters to play it out? How, how do you begin? Um, I basically start with a character. So I'm a pantser, not a plotter. So I don't plot my books. I let my characters drive the book. So I start with the characters. So when you I... start writing, do you know where the book's going? Sometimes I have a general vague idea, but a lot of times it changes because I let the characters drive what they're going to do. So they, the characters actually create the book. Um, and like a perfect example, or one of the, the most striking examples perhaps is the new series that's coming up. One of the characters was actually supposed to be killed off very early on in the book. And in, when I, in my mind, when I started thinking about this, and he ends up surviving the whole book <laughs> because he wanted to. It worked when I started writing it. I just couldn't get around. I just I couldn't do it. I couldn't kill him off. He wanted to live. So the characters really drive the story. Um, so I, I kind of start out with the idea of the characters and then I let their personalities come out and try to let them kind of tell me what they're going to do. So I, I put it in their hands and let them kind of come up with the, the, the intricacies of the story. So I know a general idea. I know kind of where I want to go with this or what I want to do with this particular set of characters or the series. But as far as what happens in chapter four or what happens in chapter six, I don't know that going in. It just happens when I start writing. And are any of the characters based on real people? Nope, they're not based on anybody real. I just kind of pluck them out of my imagination and put them on paper and let them kind of create themselves and create how they would interact with with the world that I put them in. So um, uh, the 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 closest you can get, I guess, in in particularly in Shadows, is Celeste's character was kind of based off of Laura Parker in Dark Shadows as Angelique. She was a very striking character on that show. And so when I started writing and I kind of knew the direction that I was going and I wanted it to kind of be this, you know, gothic soap opera style, supernatural suspense story, um, I knew I wanted to have like the Angelique character in there. I knew that, you know, that she had made such an impact when I watched that show. Um, so I, Celeste is kind of created off of her. Yeah. Um, but there, there's really nobody who's a real person. I, at least I hope not. There's nobody who's a real person who lived in the 1700s and lives <laughs> now too. I don't know, but um, no, they're not. They're not really based off of anybody in particular. Is there any of you in Celine slash Josie? Yeah, I mean, I think there's always a part of you in all of your characters um, because you know you're writing them, so you're you're kind of thinking through how they might react to a situation. Um, but I'm probably 
uh, closer to the Kate character in Dunhaven, the Dunhaven series. She's more close to what what I would be like in real life. Um, Josie Celine is probably far more outgoing and than I would be. Yeah, she's fearless, isn't she? She. Uh, she is. <laughs> yeah, and the two guys, uh, Damien and Michael, she uh, they can't keep up. Well, nobody can because she, she just goes for it. Yeah. Right. Um, the baddie then, who is my favorite to do, um, which is uh, Marcus Northcutt, the Duke. Where does he come from? Um, you know, I created him after watching the probably the the second rendition of Dark Shadows in the night in the nineties, and and the guy who played I think it was Ben Cross who played Barnabas there was such a good bad guy, so I kind of you know based it off of him. Um, because he's really great at being like that, you know, he's a, he, he's a terror. He's a perfect bad guy, you know? Yeah. He's, like, he's awful. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's well-bred and he's like the picture of perfectness, but underneath he's just this terrible, terrible person. And I think I, he's one of my favorites too. I love writing his dialogue because he's so bad, you know, and he can say things that no one else can and he can do things that no one else can. And he, he doesn't give a fig about anything. So, um, but he's he's going to be, I think, our surprise dark horse character because when when you get to the next book, which is gone, the third book in the series, the feedback, the early feedback that we're getting since that one was just released, the early feedback we're getting is everybody is like blown away by Marcus. Okay. Like, we continually are getting feedback about like it's not Michael, it's not Damien, it's not Celine, it's Marcus. Yeah, yeah, he's so, my favorite. I, I like the way that he's, in a way, there's a charm to him as well. You know, I mean, very early on in one of the conversations, he's like, oh, you wound me, Celine. You know, he's he's very char he's a charming buddy. He's a cad. I mean, he's just great. Yeah. So. Yeah. He's really fun to write because of that, because you can give him those like really charming kind of almost comical lines. But underneath the surface, there's meaning to them. You know what I mean? Like he, he really is saying, you know, you're you're really you're really hurting me here, Celine, and I'm trying to make things right. And he really thinks in his mind that, you know, that he's trying to make things right. He's got this unrequited love sort of thing going on. No matter, it's driving him to do all these terrible things, but in a way, right, he loves her. So he's got like a little bit of a redeeming thing going on. So you can kind of, you know, you, you, you love to hate him, but you yeah. can't hate him entirely, which is what makes him a great bad guy. Yeah, all the way through, I'm thinking like, oh, I hope he doesn't die, you know, because he's so good to do, you know. I hope he just continues. So, hey, well done with him. He he is my favorite. And did you turn the first book into an audio book? Mm -hmm, yeah. And how did how's how's this process compare to that? Was it you know just as simple? You hear my oh, dogs barking there. There they are. Or, yeah. or or am I a bit of a basket case, you know? And that's why no, we went no, backwards no. and forwards at the beginning there. I'll tell you the difference. The first book um, is a small cast. It's like for the first six chapters, it's Kate and her dog Riley, basically, because we kind of do in, in Secret of Dunhaven Castle, which is a cozy mystery. Um, there's kind of this sense of Kate is just this normal person living her life. You know, she's on her own. She's just got her little dog um, and she's, you know, she's very serious minded. Um, and she's, she's very introverted. So like I said, she's a little bit more like me that way. Um, but then the, her life turns on its ear because she inherits the Scottish castle out of nowhere and suddenly she's in Scotland. So, you know, the book goes through this kind of very mundane start of, you know, Kate finds out she might have this castle, then she finds out it is hers. And she like literally spends a, a chapter, like very methodically packing her things away because she is so like, you know, very much cut and dried. She likes things perfect and, and perfectly cut away. And her life is about to change in an amazing way when she figures out what the secret is in the new castle that she has. Um, but it's a very small cast. Like I said, it's, it's um, mostly Kate for like six chapters or so. She has a couple supporting people that come in and out. Um, and then she goes over to Scotland and it's a, it's like, there's like two other people and they're Scottish and that's basically the main cast. But the big difference with shadows was I, I, and I think we, you know, we talked about this when I said there's like 15 people. And then when I, when we, after we picked you, I emailed you back and I was like, there's actually like 20 people. When I think about it, <laughs> it's, it's a huge cast of characters. There's, there's so many people in that one. Um, and 
it, I wasn't able to pick like I was in Secret of Dunhaven Castle. I was able to pick a scene that had almost every character in it when she arrives at the castle. So, you know, we could hear the accents perfectly. And it was like, we, you know, we could figure it out. We, we didn't have to actually ask for like a 15 person accent reel because there weren't 15 people. There was like three Scottish people and Kate who was American. <laughs> Um, but this one, there was so many, and then there was like the other worldly creatures. I think we, you know, in the first book you, you get to meet Bazios, which is like a hell beast. And so he's like a serpentine form. And there's just all these characters that, um, you don't have any basis for in some cases, like the adjudicator when he comes yeah, in. in the second book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was, he was fun too, as well. He, I, I hope we get to see more of him. I enjoyed doing him too. Yeah. yeah, he comes back. Um, he comes back in the in the third book. So you'll get to have more fun doing his voice. But um, th it was such a different book. And, and it's funny because people say, why did you you wrote Dunhaven Castle? Then you moved to like this completely different book. Why? And I said, my mom was still reading The Secret of Dunhaven Castle. And I didn't want to start another Kate Kenzie book in case she hated it. So I did a whole different book just in case because I was like, if everyone hates Kate, I'm going to have like two books of Kate that everyone hated. So I did like a different series just in case. So you hedged your bets totally. I did. Yeah. I, I was like, I'm going to go for this other book that I have in mind and it's completely different. So if Kate is like a complete and utter fail, we'll have shadows. We can maybe move with that one. Maybe that'll play better. And and so we, you know, we, we had both series going kind of at the same time there. And is the goal then to go full time writing or you're still going to do the other stuff, too? Yeah, I'll keep um, I, I have no plans to leave uh, my job at Cal U right now. Um, I love my position there. I love my job there. Um, but, uh, you know, I love doing the writing, too. So I, I think it's it's the goal to just have something after I've retired out of that position, which I'm not close to yet. Um, but you know, to have something there that's like a pastime that I can, you know, keep going as, as I start to, you know, wind down my career at Cal U, which again, I'm not close to yet and I'm not thinking about yet, but, um, I absolutely love doing the writing. I did not think I did enjoy it as much as I do. Really? What's the biggest kick then from it? I think I love creating and interacting with the characters because they, like I said, I let them drive the story. Um, and you know, they, they tell me what they want me to write in a way that they, they have their own little voices that get to have feedback in on the story or say things like, I wouldn't do that. This, it should be this. Um, so like, for example, when I wrote the the newest series, the Duchess of Blackmore series, I had only written um, uh, Kate is in limited third person shadows is an omniscient third person. So you get to see everybody's perspective um, our Maggie adventure series is in limited third person from Maggie's perspective. And when I wrote, um, the Lenora story, she was like, it's, it's going to be first person. She wanted it told in first person. So I wrote it in first person. It was the first time that I had, I had done a first person narrative. Um, but I just couldn't get on board with writing it in the third person. It just didn't work. It had to be from directly from her perspective. So I think, um, it's the characters and, and a couple of people have, um, mentioned to me that that's what they enjoy about the books is the characters they're people that they would like to know or hang out with or be friends with and i think i think that's the thing that drives me is that like i love the characters that i create well that's quite a responsibility for me then if that's <laughs> it but there must be a certain risk even though you've heard the the demo reel there must be a certain risk in handing over your creations to a total stranger on another continent. Yeah, there is. I think, um, you know, there's always like that. Did I pick the right person? <laughs> but every time we listen to you, we know we did. Like my mom listens to for the read throughs um, and the listen throughs. And she's like, oh, my God, he's so good. Like we picked the right person. And I and what really did it was um when you when you sent you were a late audition actually and we were like we were almost on somebody else when your audition came through and we kept playing it and playing it and playing it. and that's what we do i mean we have massive five-hour company meetings that like deal with picking people but um the thing that did it with yours was the conversational style because um i think 
we had done an early scene in Shadows when Josie and Damien are talking about going to the movies. And yeah. he's she's like, I'm so stressed out. And he's like, let's go see a movie. Fine, I'll let you. You know, he's really, really introverted. He doesn't want to go. And she talks him into it. And there was a moment, I think, in there where she leaves the room to get her laptop. And he shouts in, pick an early show so we can, there's nobody there. And I can remember listening back to that. And you actually shouted that line, pick an early show so nobody's there. And everybody else just kind of read it like they were still in the room together. And that was one of the like major turning points for me listening to the audition. Because I was like, he actually shouted it like it would be said in my head or it would be said in a real conversation. And since Shadows is so conversation heavy because there are 20 characters and they're always talking to each other to move the plot forward, um, it's less narrative. There's not a lot from, you know, like uh, Secret of the Castle is like narrative driven. It's what Kate does during the day and how she solves this or that. Um, and Shadows is really character driven. We wanted somebody who actually made those characters sound like they were real living people, not like they were reading dialogue. Yeah. It is, it is my favorite part of it too, is the, is the, uh, is the characters. And I know, I kind of know what you mean when you say the, the characters speak to you and tell you how they want it to go. The, I find the characters tell me how they want it to be delivered. Uh, they really do. Well, thanks for that. I'm glad that, that that's great feedback on my part because I get right into them. When I do them, I see the thing in vivid, vivid technicolor. I see everything. And, and I make mistakes, as you know, I make mistakes along the way. And I was correcting one this morning that you'd picked up. And it was, uh, I forget whether it was Damon or Michael. They had the, the painting in a, in a package. But in my mind, for some reason, I'd got it on, he'd got it on his back. So I, I actually say the word backpack instead of package. And the word backpack's not even in the copy. It's just because that's what I could see. So there's clearly something wrong with me. Um, but, uh, it's just been a, a, a terrific privilege to be able to, to help you bring these things to life in another, in another form, in, in an audio book form. And uh, it, it is great because audio books are still relatively new to me. I haven't been doing them for a year yet. I've done 48 audio books since May uh, after my radio job in London went south because of and COVID and stuff. And I started doing this and I love it. I, I can't see myself... Like if I was to be offered a radio job tomorrow, it'd have to be really, really good because this is just so, this is, you know, I'm inside my closet right now where I, I record them and I've ordered, I, I'm getting it at the end of the month, a, a proper vocal booth that, that's coming. And then I'll be, so I'm expanding it and um, uh, I, I'm just, but it's just a privilege to be able to, to work on such, such a great piece of work. Well, the, the, the two of them. Uh, the, the two Shadows books I've done so far, they're great. It's really interesting that you're from a, a statistician background, not an artistic background. Is there any kind of crossover at all, like in structure maybe? Because they say there's a lot of crossover between mathematics and music, for instance. Mm -hmm. it, so is there any crossover there that helps? I think maybe, I, I don't know. I want to say like we're, we're, statistics requires you to be pretty creative. Um, a really? lot of people don't think that. Yeah, a lot of people think, you know, I just go into Excel and like the guy on the office, you know, hit the return button, crunch, and the numbers crunch. But that's really not the case because especially now with data science, there's so much data that you have to start to think creatively to figure out how you're going to process it and how you're going to spin it for somebody, especially without knowledge, to make a, an educated decision about the data. So, um, you know, if you think about it, like the way I would talk to a fellow statistician is completely different than the way I would talk to like a PepsiCo exec who comes in and says, did this coupon do us any good? And you have to think about how, what data can I pull in and how can I tell him whether or not, you know, by showing him the full picture, cause it's not going to just be how many coupons got turned in. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. you have to think about, um, you know, did they end up buying more what types of people um, got the coupon and used it? Was there a specific demographic that we can pick on so we can you know, look for a specific mode to get coupons to these people to make them um, from like kind of lukewarm consumers to you know, red hot leads for us? 
So there's a lot, especially now um, with the data science and, and like the market basket analysis type of stuff. So do people come into the grocery store and buy like bread, milk and eggs or do they buy like diapers and wine, which is a weird thing that people always buy together for some reason? Really? That's um, that's true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's true. They We pick up on that all the time. So that's why like... Um, or like a, a more simple example, if you, if you walk down like grocery store aisles or supermarket aisles here in the U S you'll see bananas way far from the produce over in the cereal aisle because people buy bananas and cereal together. So they cut a banana on their cereal. So, um, they'll put like a rack of bananas way over in the cereal aisle. So people who are running in to buy cereal will also buy bananas at the same time. Cause they see them there and they're like, Oh, bananas, I'll take those too. I don't have to run across the store to get them. So um, it's that kind of stuff. It's like product placement. Um, you know, we obviously the sugary kid cereals are right at kid eye level so that your kid will say, oh, can I get the sugary cereal? And you'll likely say yes. And you'll put it in the cart. And that's why they place them at the level they place them. So there's lots of decisions that are creative based on what you know about the, the science behind statistics and data science and how people generally behave. So there is a crossover. Lots of people think, there's no creativity in statistics. You really have to be creative, especially with the massive data sets that we have now. How can I pull the information and make sense of it? Wow, yeah, because before I thought about it, the only way I could see, you know, statisticians being creative is, is when they put obesity figures on a pie chart. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't have more creativity than that. <laughs> Okay, so the book is called, the one that's on sale now um, through Amazon and iTunes and uh, where's the other places? There's, there's three, Amazon, iTunes and Audible, of course Audible, uh, is, um, is Shadows of the Past, which is the first in the series. We've just finished the second one, so that should be up within a month, I would say. We, we only, I only clicked it today, didn't we? We only finished it, literally mm -hmm. we finished yep. it a couple of hours ago. So yeah. that one's that one's ready to go, and then there's next. So so now you you've conquered the world of of being um, a leading statistician. You're also uh, animal rescue um, heroine, an animal rescue I don't know hero heroine, whichever way you want to describe it. And you're a best-selling author. What's next? I'm gonna keep going with the best-selling author thing. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I really enjoy it. And like I said, I mean, in two years, we've expanded our company beyond what I ever thought. I mean, when I hit the publish button in uh, November of 2019, I never thought in 2021 that I would have um, seven books under my belt, an eighth on the way, um, multiple audiobooks. We just did not expect it to bloom like it did. And and I'm I'm having a lot of fun. And and. I think what we're going to do is probably expand the part of the fiction business. So I've been taking more classes to learn better marketing strategies, um, better sales strategies and stuff like that. And, and the other thing that we haven't expanded on yet is my mom and I together um, were at murder mystery parties, murder mystery games. Um, we started out with that. We would write them for family and friends. Actually, we have a, we have a big um, game room and with like a drop ceiling. And what we would do on Halloween is we would build a Halloween maze. And we would do, um, from the drop ceiling, we would hang like um, black sheeting and we would put stuff on it or whatever. And you'd uh, actually have to go in and solve your way through the maze. And you'd have to um, go back in and find clues and try to solve mysteries and stuff like that. And it expanded from like being this like really kind of quirky, silly little maze to being so in depth that like people are like, running in and out of the maze to try to find clues and figure stuff out and find if they can, um, you know, find like last year we did, um, I think we did uh, like a psychiatry ward with like these crazy patients. Um, and so we had all these little patient cells and they'd have to go in and find out about the patients and solve mysteries with them and stuff like that. Um, and so we have really kind of taken that game aspect and we'd like to grow that a little bit more too because we'd like to have like a little mystery club you not only read our books but you can play the games or you can get a mystery of the month to solve or something like that so i think i think that's the direction we're heading with the fiction business um i think that's what's what's next for us but but for now uh, keep the books coming because I'm really enjoying writing them and I'm enjoying hearing um, like you bring them to life and, and I'm telling you what in shadows 
we listen, we do the listen throughs and, and we're like excited to do the listen throughs. Like sometimes you're listening to your own stuff and it's like, Oh, how many hours am I listening to this? Um, because it's just your words droning on in, in, in your head. But we are really like entertained by the way you bring the characters to life. I think, I think I could have guessed that Marcus was your favorite because every time he comes on, we're like, here he comes. He's going to do the Marcus because it's, it's so entertaining. We're, we're really having fun listening to him. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for choosing me to do this. Shadows of the Past is the first in the Shadow Slayers stories. If you'd like to get the first one for free with uh, an audible subscription, you can get audible free if you're watching this on YouTube. You can get audible for free for 30 days and you can download the book for free if, if, you know, within those 30 days. And there's a link in the description below in YouTube. If you click on that, that'll take you straight there for the one for Shadows on the pa of the Past. You can go straight in there and you can find out more about what we've been talking about for a little while. Uh, Melissa, the book is by Nelly H. Steele. Nelly H. Steele is what you should be looking for. Uh, Melissa, it's been a pleasure to finally meet you after all this time of going backwards and forwards and uh, continued success. Thank you very much. Thank you.